Welcome back to lecture number 58. Today we are talking about historical topic 6.13, politics in the Gilded Age. And our theme is, of course, politics and power. One learning objective for the day, that is explain the similarities and differences between the political parties during the Gilded Age. And that's what we're going to get to the very beginning here. So we're going to start with the major political parties appeals to lingering divisions from the Civil War and contended over tariffs, currency issues, even as reformers argued that economic greed and self-interest had corrupted all levels of government. Now, these two major parties we're talking about are still the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans, they continue to wave the bloody shirt. This is reminding the general population about the Civil War and how the Republicans were on the side of the Union and the Democrats that were in the South were on the side of the Confederacy. So that if the Democrats win control of government, that they will undo everything that the Republicans have done and um, go back to the antebellum period. So the Republicans had support from northern states, the Midwest, African Americans, reformers, anyone that wanted uh, a bigger government. The Democrats, they continued to hold on to the solid South. These are the states that used to be part of the Confederacy. They're seen in the top right map. Uh, all of the states that were uh, on there, except for some of the border states there, West Virginia and um, Kentucky, are included there. But you'll see that they will continue to vote for the Democratic Party into the 1960s. And Democratic political machines are starting to organize and mobilize voters in large cities. They start to get support from Catholics and Jews. And now some of the issues that these two parties will um, debate over would be the tariffs. This is the first one. Republicans, they still want a high protective tariff because Republican strongholds are in the north. There's a lot more industrial capacity in the north, and they benefit from a tariff that's going to make outside foreign goods less competitive in the American market. The biggest of these is the McKinley Tariff of 1890 and the Dingley Tariff of 1897. You can tell from the uh, U.S. average tariff rates in the charts below that you, there are big upswings in the 1890s in which the McKinley Tariff and the Dingley Tariff raise rates. Now you see that there is also a dip in between those two and that is the Wilson-Gorman Tariff of 1894. So when uh, Democrats took control of Congress they lowered the tariff down from the rates of the McKinley tariff to try and make products cheaper for areas that had less industry. That was going to benefit them more. Uh, pictured up above is, of course, William McKinley, who the McKinley tariff is named after, and then he will later become a Republican presidential candidate in 1896, win that election, and become a Republican president. Currency is the other big issue. Uh, there is the Panic of 1893, which makes economic conditions uh, pretty bad for workers, for farmers. And there is a fear that the U.S. is going to run out of gold inside of its treasury. This would make the dollar basically worthless. If, it can, if the U.S. government cannot back the dollars that are out in the economy with the gold in its treasury, then people will lose um, trust in the U.S. as a world economy. There will be less trade. And so um, J.P. Morgan actually comes in to the rescue, lends the U.S. $65 million in gold, to try and back the currency. Now, this helps, but it doesn't completely end the Panic of 1893. There's still going to be a lot of discontent. You'll see Coxey's army march to Washington from the Midwest asking for more government spending. This is the first of two of um, Coxey's march to Washington. We'll see another one in the 20th century. But because of these issues um, that most laborers and farmers attribute to the use of gold as the main backing to the U.S. dollar. There is a push for getting rid of the gold standard and adding a backing of silver to the U.S. dollar. This is an issue that's going to split the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is pretty strong on the support for the gold standard. 
But the Democrats don't necessarily agree. There's going to be a gold bug faction of the Democratic Party that is going to want the gold standard and the civil rights faction that's going to want to have an equivalency of gold and silver at a ratio of 16 silver to one gold. This was ridiculed at the time because the actual value, the actual exchange rate of silver to gold at the time was 32 to 1. So it would drive up inflation massively and it would drive up the, the um, value of the silver. And given that there was a lot of silver uh, available due to new discoveries of, uh, of, of silver deposits, this was going to be good for farmers and debtors. So we're also dealing with corruption during this time period. Uh, we see this in political party machines, and they're operating on patronage. Now, patronage is exchanging jobs, government jobs, for votes. So party bosses would go out to their neighborhood and make sure that everyone in the neighborhood is voting for their political party, and in exchange for their votes, they would receive some sort of favors or jobs in the government. This is one of the reasons why we have some of the highest voter turnouts uh, for all elections in this Gilded Age period. Uh, the immigrants in the cities are becoming mobilized and uh, the political party machines are targeting them. They're helping them settle down in the cities, finding them jobs, finding them uh, work because they know that once they go through the naturalization process and become U.S. citizens, they could be reliable voters if they remember the political party machine that helped them get settled. This use of patronage to get votes ends up in tragedy for President Garfield. So Charles Guiteau was a discontented job seeker. He wanted to have a federal government job. He is denied and he takes his revenge on President Garfield, shoots him, you see the political cartoon at the bottom left. He's holding a sign that says, an office or your life. Well, President Arthur, who takes over after Garfield, doesn't want to be shot by someone who was denied a government job. So he, uh, President, Garf uh, President uh, Arthur and the Congress passed the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. It introduces a level of meritocracy to the bureaucracy, eliminates some of the jobs that are given out as patronage so that people can't be angry when they don't get a job after they have mobilized voters for a certain candidate. All right, we also have a new third party during this period called the Populist Party. And economic instability inspired agrarian activists to, to create this people's or populist party, which called for a stronger government role in regulating the American economic system. So the new populist party consolidated the views of the previous Farmers Alliance uh, and also took the interest of industrial workers into consideration. All of their beliefs were listed in the Omaha platform, which was their 1892 platform when uh, James Weaver ran for president. They wanted the unlimited coinage of silver, a graduated income tax, government ownership of railroads and telegraphs, um, action by the government to stabilize crop prices, an eight-hour workday, the direct election of senators, the use of initiatives and referendums in governments to give people more power in the policies that the government is adopting. Now, all of these policies were wildly popular with the uh, farmers of America. They would have been very popular with industrial workers. And eventually, some of these uh, beliefs will get adopted by the U.S. government, but not until the 20th century. So they are really ahead of their time. Um, another way in which the populists are seen to be ahead of their time is that they are trying to build a biracial voting coalition. They are asking white Americans and black Americans for their votes. Thomas E. Watson, who will later be the Populist Party nominee in 1904 for president, was running in Georgia in the 1890s, and he was trying to appeal to both black and white voters. 
Now, the election of 1892 um, is lost by the populist. They're a brand new party. They weren't really expecting to win, but they do pretty well for themselves. They get almost 9% of the popular vote, and they get 22 electoral votes, which is not a easy task for a third party to do, to steal away electoral votes from one of the other two parties. So, 1892, we have the first presidential campaign by populist. And by 1896, the Democratic Party sees that the populist appeal is losing them votes. So they're going to adopt some of the policies of the Omaha platform. The uh, unlimited coinage of silver and the end of the gold standard is one of the more popular policies that they adopt from the populists. So William Jennings Bryan, who is only 36 at the time, is going to become the Democratic candidate for president in 1896. At his acceptance speech, he makes, uh, or at the, at the convention, he makes an acceptance speech, which is dubbed the Cross of Gold speech, because he ends it talking about the gold standard. He ends it by saying, having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. So uh, he is saying that they have the support of the working classes of America and that they are going to resist the gold standard that they are um, arguing here only benefits the wealthy people of America. So he is wildly ridiculed but, uh, for his speech by evoking this biblical imagery, as you can see in the cartoon on the top right. But the Populist Party given that their views have been adopted by a major party, also nominate William Jennings Bryan for president. So they have this coalition going into the election. But the gold standard interest and the industrialists have too much influence, and William McKinley wins the election of 1896. This loss is going to lead to the decline of the populists, though some of their policies will be adopted by progressives in the 20th century. All right, in political machines, we have an urban atmosphere where the access to power was unequally distributed. Political machines thrived in part by providing immigrants and the poor with social services. So like we said before, machines relied on patronage. They helped immigrants settle, hoping that in the future they would return that favor with votes. The party bosses would gain personal gain through graft. So we, some of the most famous party bosses was uh, Boss Tweed, William Marcy Tweed, and George Washington Plunkett. Now, Tweed was actually arrested and convicted for graft in 1872. Uh, he was called out by the political cartoonist Thomas Nast, as you see in those cartoons. Graft is essentially stealing money from the government. So they would skim some of the money that was coming in that was being paid through taxes. Now, George Washington Plunkett, who, was, who came after Tweed, developed this concept of honest graft. So he would use his information on things that were happening inside of the government, and then he would make some financial moves that would benefit him from whatever the government was doing. So if the government was planning on building a new park, he would buy up some empty land and then direct the government to use the land that he had bought for that park. So he writes an entire book about it called Honest Craft, in which he talks about how the things that he is doing to enrich himself are not wrong, they're just smart. Well, today they would be illegal. Uh, additionally to the, to the the defense of honest graft, George Washington Plunkett is also going to be launching attacks to civil, civil service reform, saying that the things that are found on the civil service reform tests are useless and that they're not going to reflect whether someone's going to be a good federal worker. Now, um, the reason why Plunkett was attacking civil service reform is because it actually was being effective at reducing the influence of political machines. 
All right, and that was it. Here's our recap. The parties in the late 19th century were still structured and supported uh, similar stances as the mid-19th century political parties. The new issues of currency and corruption um, were addressed. The issue of the tariff continues. The populist party gains popularity in the 1890s. They propose progressive economic and political platforms. And finally, political party machines worked on patronage and they lose prominence with civil service reform. So that's it for this lecture. We have one more lecture, number 59, left in period six. So please come back and watch that later on.